Brent, maybe you can help us with that. Well, it's funny that you mention that. Um, I think there's been some studies that show, at least in the college realm, you know, there's masturbation between both women and men. And it's kind of hard to find one particular side of whether it's right or wrong, because it's a very personal thing, uh, depending on who that person is, you know, whether there's conviction on that action or not. So um, definitely, I think that, you know, masturbation is a tool. Um, some people appreciate that tool more than others. Uh, but even so, like, there's the people that use that tool and then feel condemned um, you know, which leads to all sorts of psychological effects. Um, yeah, so just, just, to, just to say, I think we definitely utilizing that. Well, you know, I, I want to I help you out with that because right now, as far as uh, when we talk about pornographic in images as well, uh, that probably aids this, $30 billion uh, a minute, uh, $30 million a minute being spent on pornography. Uh, and pornography has risen amongst women and in dormitories as well, where women are now engaging, uh, not to the same degree as men, but now 47% of women are, are also viewing pornography as well, uh, which was not a female expression. So I, I, I want to talk about what, this, what the scripture says, and you're talking about this condemnation, because really what we're talking about is you know, I've got needs, and I want to deal with the needs that I have. That's what we've heard over and over. But uh, what do we do when, when those needs also need to be exercised? Priscilla, I want to bring you back into that. I think it's interesting, um, the idea of masturbation, because there are a lot of alternatives. People think, oh, you know, the only way I can release the sexual tension I have is, is to masturbate or to satisfy myself, you know. Um, but uh, I was reading, and it's actually, um, so masturbation, what happens is it releases endorphins, which is a, a feel-good hormone, something that makes you feel good. But a physical activity actually uh, releases uh, the same amount of endorphins. Um, there's something called a runner's high, which um, makes us just feel good, it makes us feel happy. So um, there are other releases for the sexual tension other than masturbation. There's you know, um, also laughing and having fun and doing things that you like. Those are other things that you can do. They may not release the same amount of endorphins as exercise, but there are a lot of alternatives. So it's not um, necessarily, you know, the only way to release a sexual tension uh, through masturbation. And, and, and I think that's interesting because when we, when we see from a male and a female perspective um, and how, how we process this, and even uh, a male in a, in, a, in a dominated culture of images that are continually bombarding us. Edward, uh, I'd like to bring you into that. Well, you're right, right? Like, um, pornography is a $7 billion industry um, targeted towards young men. And when you look at the, how it makes you think, it's usually geared towards the fantasies that men w want to have, right? So things like recreational sex, with no commitment. We're talking about courtship and those things. Um, they say that men who tend to watch pornography are tend to engage in more reckless forms of sex, unprotected sex, recreational sex, and they tend to see it as normal because pornography is in so many places, right? Like schools, you'll see pornography in a school, you'll see pornography in the workplace. So people want to try those things now because they're saying, oh, like there's, these are people who are doing these things, right? And it's interesting. And even when you talk about just um, we're bombarded with images, period. You watch any music video in our days and you see all those images and those things. So you see uh, sex has become something that is no longer seen as um, that much as valuable as some people or sacred. It's just becoming a thing where it's, it's open. Like, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can just have a one night stand like yesterday and it's like, you know, that's bragging rights usually. And that's what pornography is really doing to people's um, sense and feelings about sex, sexuality, and even how they carry themselves, how men view women. Um, that's changing drastically, you know? It's like, um, you, women has to have particular things, like look over the top, you know, hair done, you know, bigger breasts, bigger things, right? That, that pornography has, you know, um, deeply influenced the way young men think. Young men are more um, susceptible to those ideas that pornography presents. Whereas they say more older men, you know, who are educated or who are different tend not to watch pornography as much, even though they may they may, may still 
do it, but not as much. Uh, a lot of time is being, some men are watching up to six hours of pornography a day, you know? Um, so you see that even um, decreasing, like your work, people are addicted, it's an addiction. It's not just like watching a movie or something and you go do something, it's actually an addiction where people are spending a lot of time doing it, so. Uh, I kind of just wanted to like touch on both what uh, Edward and Priscilla were saying um, because there's actually, in the case of masturbation, there's actually two components to it. You know, Priscilla was more talking about uh, the physical chemical releases, um, which I think is how the girls kind of view it. Whereas with the males, it's really a psychological issue. You know, like how how they perceive sexuality in the world. You know, how they allow images to affect them, and uh, you know, some of the, the research I've done actually shows that. There's about 15 guys in the college dorms, yeah, um, sorry, guys in the college dorms would masturbate about 15 times a month than opposed to the girls, which are like uh, closer to five, you know, times a month. So I, I, I just think it's important to highlight that, you know, women kind of perceive this, this tool of masturbation completely separate to, to the guys, you know, like it's not, it's not so much, we wouldn't see that physical fulfillment as described, whereas, you know, women might be very satisfied um, with that exercising and stuff, you know, that, that might be satisfa satisfactory for them. But to us, it's really a psychological thing, you know. Uh, some people could make the argument that it, it increases your self-esteem. Some people might say it decreases your self-esteem, you know. So there's, there's a whole bunch of dimensions just on that particular issue. What are not? Sorry. Oh, no, no. No, I'm just saying another point. Like, pornography usually will frustrate men. So it's like, it has, always has to lead on to something. So a lot of the time, like some studies that I was doing or some research, it was showing that men will tend to, who watch pornography a lot, will be tend more to be likely to buy sex, um, buy like the services of, of an escort or a prostitute or whatnot, or try and find it in a different way. Cause now it's like, they're watching those images and you know, it's really, you know, it's doing something in their mind, of course. And it's like, now you need the release. So you tend to see like guys, that is why men will usually lead to masturbation or something, or something else like that, because it's like, I have all these thoughts, you know, and I want to release, like, the thoughts, so it's not really, it doesn't really, because man, even men who, who exercise or do those things, it's like, so I, I would agree with Brent's point where, you know, it's more psychological, you know, and I would, as a Christian, I would even say a spiritual issue, <laughs> you know, that is that happens in men when they watch pornography. Uh, Mary Lynn, you wanted to jump in there? Yeah. Um, I would think that when women get caught up in that, it's a perverted fantasy romance. And we all desire love, and God is love. And um, he, 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 gives, he gives us love, and we, we receive love. We, um, we then uh, you know, uh, give out his love to others and enjoy love. And so I think it comes down to um, men don't know, men not knowing what it means to be men in this day and age, and women not understanding what it means to be a woman. Um, and so identity is a huge, uh, a huge issue. And um, and where are we getting those 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 identities from, and what yeah, what's communicating yeah. that to us as far as our masculinity and also our femininity? Right, right. And so um, we get our identity from Christ. And so if you don't under, if you don't know who Christ is in, uh, if you don't know who Christ is, and you don't know who Christ is in you, you do not know yourself. And it's, um, I know we were discussing a lot about intimacy, and it's truly into me. You see into Christ. You see who you who you are, who your identity is. Mm -hmm. I'd like to jump off what um, Marilyn was saying that. Um, I was uh, reading a conference called Sex and the Supremacy of God, and I believe that's what she was alluding to, is that when it talks about when God is so supreme in our lives, um, he was saying that, that knowing God, because you were talking about knowing God, Marilyn, knowing God as we ought, because we're, we're all learning about him and, and, and knowing him, as we ought, then the issue of sexuality is put in its perspective. So we're dealing with, we're talking about what we do when we have all these drives and urges and we can't satisfy them in a covenantal marriage. Mm -hmm. And why would, then would God say, you have sex within marriage and then leave us frustrated with these desires? But if we know him as we ought, then uh, this, just his majesty, the supremacy, how we hold God in our lives, where we, where we place him in our lives and where we place all of our circumstances and our issues, then um, 
when it's put in perspective, we we are then able to deal with with our sexual urges practically, because knowing God also guards our sexuality, and He talks about um, Ezekiel 16 where um, how God created us and He created us. Uh, it's a very intimate intimate. Um, well, this is from Ezekiel's point of view, but he, it's a, it was a very intimate process, sure. and almost sensual. And uh, and when we disobey and we're, we're not, we don't know God because we fall out of you know His purpose and plans for us. That He compares us to prostitution. Yes. So it's the same thing. It's sexuality as alluded to prostitution. So um, so the, the the things that we're dealing with, it seems it seems like it's not. It seems like we're dealing with those things because we don't know God. And and I know the Christians. You know, we're looking for you know a solution to our problems now, and we're and it may not seem like knowing God is working because otherwise we wouldn't be you know having sex out of marriage, we wouldn't be um, uh, masturbating, and we wouldn't be you know looking at pornography. And the instead of turning and looking at uh, the circumstance to say how do I deal with this you know my my sexual urges, um, and going back to God as our you know you know our first response to to look at Him first. Then um, and to know him more, know him deeper, uh, then that would actually uh, his knowing him would be a covering over our whole lives, and it would uh, it would take care of these urges that we have. You know, I'd like to jump in on that just to I, I'm appreciating the conversation and where you guys are going with this. Thank you for really the exchange that you're you're also giving uh, from a, a biblical perspective. I'd like to put some some pieces in place just so you'd understand a little bit what the scriptures say. Because I think what we're, we're, we're experiencing right now is the dumbing down of Christianity. We're living in a generation where people don't really understand what the Bible says. And what we're doing is we're thinking that God is a prude somehow and he's so uh, opposed to us having a good time. And uh, I, I, I'd like to really help us understand a few things from that standpoint. When we look at the book of the Songs of Solomon, we hear the Shulamite and we hear about Solomon himself. They actually said that they couldn't read this book because it was supposed to invoke certain feelings because the feelings were so strong that it would cause people to begin to engage in those feelings before it was time and they would not be able to put the proverbial Pandora back into the box. But scripturally what God was saying is he says, uh, put me as a seal upon your heart for love is stronger than death. And he, he really, if you look through the book, he talks about uh, the, the physique and the physicality of the courtship that is leading up. And he's saying uh, the breast of the woman, how beautiful they are, and, and her teeth and her eyes and pools. And my God, I don't think Casanova had a better, better handle in him than, than Solomon did on this particular because, I mean, he knew how to talk to a woman. I mean, right there, I felt like said, oh, you know, yes, in the name of Jesus. But what we find out of that is we, we get a, a, a clear understanding of the heart of God, which someone has mentioned before, is intimacy. And that's what he's looking for. Into me, you see. That's why it has to start off with a spirit oneness. And the spirit oneness is, is what we are as spiritual beings. We're not just physical beings having a temporary uh, spiritual experience, but we're phys spiritual beings having a temporary physical experience in these bodies. And so what it's saying is once you have, and I think someone mentioned that that, that sex is the closest thing that we have to actual uh, marriage uh, and truly the relationship we have with God. Because he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, you could love a person uh, with your mind, but if your body's not there, Bubba, it's not going to happen. You can love a person with your spirit, but if you're, you're, you're actually emotionally down because you're discouraged and everything, it's not really going to happen. You can love a person with your emotions. You can love a person uh, with your body. But if your spirit, uh, again, is heavy, it really doesn't happen. So it's putting the whole man, the, the, the whole spirit man, the emotional man, the, the physical man, and putting it in the same package. And God says, when you do it my way, I'll rock your world. Your eyes will roll back in your head. You get so excited that your giddy up will go and the flag will go up the pole and everybody will hear the Star Spangled Banner and sing it on the same tune. What he's basically saying is that he has created us to be very tactile beings, physical. He's made us to be very visual beings. And he's made us to be very emotional beings. 
and he wants all of that to be engaged in this as well. Now, I do understand there are some complications in this generation because what we see on popular uh, culture with television, with, with media, with everything that we do see, and from a male perspective, I mean, I, I feel for the men these days because as they're waiting longer and longer to get married, it doesn't mean that the drive has gotten less with this generation. <laughs> it just means that we're using other ways in order to express that part of who we are until we get to the part where we trust. So I think we're coming down and we're dealing with a trust issue now. How much can we trust the person? Can I trust them with my heart and that I'm in this relationship that they're going to do what they say and they're going to be whatever they say? And I think we're also dealing with another issue as well because well, as much as the trust issue is such a big issue, I think one of, the, one of the bigger issues that we're dealing with is from what I've seen in my past, it does not reflect that I'm going to see anything different in my future because I haven't seen a lot of people actually do this well. <laughs> and because I haven't seen them do this well, I'm waiting till I get it right. And I'm asking the question now, and this is where I want to pivot back to you and give it back to you. Um, I want to go back to something now because, uh, and, and Brent, you were talking about uh, the whole purpose of a release that we get from masturbation versus uh, a male perspective and a female perspective. Could you could you underscore that? Just kind of help us understand what you were saying. So basically, what I was saying is um, how we use masturbation is uh, different to each individual. Even how we perceive it, how it affects us, both physically and psychologically. Um, and as Priscilla was saying, you know, she finds that um, in women, you know, they could achieve, achieve the same release from exercising. Um, but what I was referring to when it comes to as we're discussing on pornography, uh, that's where you find men most relating to, to masturbation is, is a more of a psychological effect on them where you know they, they perceive their sexuality based on what images they're fed. So because they're, they're visual creatures, exactly. they need to actually have something that represents. Exactly. Yeah. And um, because of that, you know, um, how, how we use it, you know, whether we, we go this out, outlet to another outlet, that then affects our psyche. You know, depending on whether you're a person who might be convicted yeah. by masturbating, you know, um, you might feel dirty after the act. Or someone where, you know, you're, you're in a society where masturbation is acceptable, that might not affect you in the same way. So it's very hard to say that f for across the board, you know, masturbation is perceived as good or as bad. It, okay. It's based like on the individual. Down, because I, I think what we're finding right now, we, we have a difference between male and female as well. And is, is there a consequence to that? Because I know you had some strong yeah. views on that, Sydney. I was just thinking, when I hear you talking about masturbation, I hate to say it, it's just like self-sabotage. Um, what you're doing is you're sinning against yourself. You know, we can all sin outside of the body, but sexual immorality is the one sin that we can do that's actually in our own body. Whether it start with looking at pornography, well, that's stimulating your mind, which is going to lead to something else and lead to something else. Next thing you know, um, you know, it could be that one day you're walking down the street and you're attracting, I hate to say it, but you're attracting weirdos for some reason, or you get creeps calling on you all the time. Well, we forget that we're actually in a spiritual battle, and it's not just the flesh that we're up against, it's the spirit. So if we're in that mental state and you know, someone has an addiction to sex or masturbation, you're setting off things in the spiritual realm even though you can't see them, we are living in the supernatural and the invisible. You could be encountering that in your day-to-day -day life and wondering where it's coming from. Nighttime, you're going home and you're committing that act of sin and thinking it's doing no harm, but what you're doing is sabotaging yourself and in the end, you're going to find yourself in a foggy mess. Well, let me ask you a question. It, 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 it's, it's, it's gross, man. Nah, I, I completely agree with what Sydney's talking about, yeah. like fully. But also, there's yeah. also another aspect we're missing here. It's also the biological aspect of it. Yeah. Because scientifically, there's also proof that you know masturbation is good for you because it releases the old, like even for men, the sperm that's getting old, it releases that. At the same time, there's also a natural tendency to occur after a long time of even being absent from sex or sexual thoughts that eventually your body naturally needs to release regardless. Yeah. So I think we're also missing that out. So there is a healthy way of doing it without going up here mentally or spiritually. Right. Because there is an actual, what I've even found out in my own personal self, because I mean, I trust me, I went like months without even doing it or mm -hmm. thinking about it. Yeah. But my body raged against it yeah. because naturally you need to release, yeah. right? So you do end up doing it without actually taking a physical, sexual thought. It's 
So I there is there is an actual like I'm saying there is actually. So you're saying there's a release without actually. Right, without, without sex being the actual drive where your body needs to release it. And I think that also has been kind of left out a bit because I'm thinking there's yeah. like for, you know, for men, but yeah. like, what about for women though? Yeah, but I hear you though. I mean, we all have drives, right? Like not even drives. This is more of like on a biological just, just standpoint. I think, I think that masturbation it could be good for you in a certain sense because it's like earlier when we were talking about courting and abstinence, and I was saying about how sometimes the actual act of waiting to have sex for a certain period of time can actually relationships from the inside because of all the frustration that's happening so in that case if you're choosing to be abstinent or you're choosing to be choosing to court and not having sex then masturbation could be that tool to actually help you guys deal with that or cope with it so exactly it could be used as a tool to deal with social settings you may be going out to a club with that completely in your mind just sex using masturbation as a tool helps you cope with that drive it helps you cope with um, leaving um, leaving the physical component out of your mind and focusing more on who the person brings to the table. And it could potentially help you build a relationship. But that's almost like using masturbation as a crutch. Because if you're supposed to be doing some things, you know, your life is supposed to be following a certain path, and you have found uh, some wiggle room to say that, you know what, I'm supposed to be dealing with this sexual drive by courting a woman or dating and then getting married so that I can have a healthy sexual relationship. But now um, that's not necessary because I can use mas I can masturbate whenever I need to, you know, have that release. Then I think you bring up an important subject because one of the things that masturbation does do is every man has in his pocket a, per a picture of a perfect woman and every woman has a picture of a perfect man in her purse. But what ends up happening over time is when we have used images and what, what Brent was talking about and I think Edward was pivoting on before and those images become so strong in our mind, no woman can live up to that particular image. Uh, and I think that you're, you're talking about the, the harmful part of that, and that is controlling our own intimacy. And that means that even in a, in a healthy relationship, I'll get to the point and I said, well, if you're not in the mood or you're not in a place, and I mean even in a covenant relationship, I can just satisfy myself. And uh, I think over time, and I've seen in marriages, it has had some ramifications when there's no longer that desire for one another because now we, we've moved from dating into an actual courting, into a, a, a covenant or even a married relationship. From a woman's perspective, I need to hear you guys kind of come in on this because we're hearing what, what men say as far as the natural, natural biological and I think you guys have been very, very, very honest and open and I, I applaud you for this because I know that it's going to help a lot of men. Uh, but from a, a female's perspective. Well, for us, I think sex means a lot more, it's more than just the physical act. It's like, you know, it's giving our love. So there's more passion and more affection. It means a lot more as opposed to a guy who can just have sex with a girl and the next day be fine about it and, and go on and not really, it doesn't have the same meaning. So for us, we attach a different meaning, emotional attachment, whereas a guy, it's more of a physical act. And, 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 but with the physical, because you're a physical creature as well, is, yeah. is there, is, is there as, as, as Daniel was talking about, that uh, your body's natural response that says, you know what, I, I, I want a healthy touch, I want the opposite sex, I want to be held. 